Hello everyone, welcome back to part two of my look back at Dungeons & Dragons 4th edition. Uh, in the first part, I looked at the pressure the Wizards of the Coast felt with the rise of the massive multiplayer online role-playing game like World of Warcraft, uh, as well as their decision to kind of pursue the MMO demographic, uh, creating a version of the game that was meant to appeal to the sensibilities of those that play things like World of Warcraft. Uh, now, in this video, what I want to do is look at the actual release of the 4th edition, uh, as well as the birth of its largest competitor. Uh, now, Dungeons & Dragons 4th edition released in June of 2008, and while reactions to its announcements and the subsequent preview materials were rather mixed, 4th uh, edition still managed to sell out its first print run during the pre-order phase, uh, with Wizards of the Coast announcing the second printing would occur prior to the, the physical release. Uh, at the time of uh, release, all three of the traditional core books were available at the same time. So that was the uh, Player's Handbook, the Dungeon Master's Guide, as well as the Monster Manual. So what we're going to do is we're just going to have a look through, uh, kind of discuss each of the uh, the core books and a little bit of details of what was inside of them, and uh, we'll kind of go on from there. So let's start with the 4th edition Player's Handbook. Uh, customers familiar with previous editions of Dungeons & Dragons who bought the 4th edition Player's Handbooks were actually in for a bit of a shock when they flipped through it and looked at the selection of races and classes. Uh, some of the races and classes from previous editions uh, actually didn't uh, make an appearance in the first Player's Handbook. So let's uh, have a look through here. We'll get to the, uh, the races. So the races included in this book um, that were carried over from previous editions were uh, the Dwarves, uh, we had the Eladrin, which are sort of the, the like the version of High Elves uh, for 4th edition, we had uh, Elves, which are traditional Wood Elves, and then we had uh, races like the Half Elf, the Halfling, and the, uh, the Human. So new races involved in this book would, were the, uh, the Tiefling, which is sort of a carryover from, uh, from 3.5. The, uh, the Tiefling uh, race became a bit more popular with that one, so they actually made it a full-blown player character race in 4th edition. And they also introduced the Dragonborn, which is sort of a uh, draconic humanoid, almost like having the half-dragon template, but a little bit uh, more stripped down again from its popularity in 3.5. Uh, however, missing from the races were some of the uh, the traditional favorites, like the gnome uh, did not make an appearance in the 4th edition player's handbook, and uh, neither did the half-orc, so the half-orc was gone as well. Uh, as far as the classes go, uh, the conventional classes that made their uh, return for 4th uh, edition were the, uh, the cleric, uh, the fighter, here. Uh, Paladin, Ranger, and the uh, the Rogue, and the Wizard. So they were the traditional uh, classes that made their appearance once again in 4th edition. Uh, two new classes were introduced, or making uh, one of them made its first appearance in one of the actual core books. Uh, so the two new classes that were introduced were the Warlord uh, and the Warlock. So the Warlord is sort of like uh, a knight that helps direct battle uh, it's kind of a support character over the uh, over traditional fighters, so a lot of things that they do allow you to affect uh, your companions. And <clears throat> the Warlock is similar to the Warlock version that they had in uh, 3.5 in uh, Complete Arcane, uh, which is sort of an arcane-based character that uh, derives its power through a pact that they made with some sort of uh, external force. Uh, so those were the classes that were in the player's handbook, uh, but the classes that were actually missing uh, were the Barbarian, the Bard, the Druid, the Monk, and the Sorcerer, if you're looking to carry over from, from 3.5. Uh, this was actually all part of Wizards of the Coast's marketing strategy for 4th edition, uh, which was to release the core rules in volumes. Uh, so the first player's handbook that we have here uh, focuses on uh, arcane, divine, and martial heroes. So these are the new kind of archetype power sources that they introduced for 4th edition. Uh, so in order to get classes that didn't quite fit those molds, uh, you had to get future releases for the player's handbook. So if you were fans of the Barbarian, Bard, Druid, and Sorcerer, you had to pick up the player's handbook 2, 
uh, which came out in March of 2009. Uh, now this actually I believe also had the half work and the gnome uh, races in here so if you wanted uh, the gnome and the half orc then this was the book that you kind of had to go to get them from as well as those uh, those previous classes that were all considered to be primal characters uh, so they were part of the player's handbook too which also introduced a slew of new classes as well uh, if you were looking to be uh, playing a monk in fourth edition you actually had to hold out all the way until March of 2010 uh, with the release of the player's handbook 3 uh, so this is the one that added the psionic uh, power source, where the Player's Handbook 2 added Primal. Uh, and this included the monk, which was considered to be a psionic character because its abilities derived from its own uh, like sheer uh, mental discipline and, and force of will. Uh, now each of these Player's Handbooks did contain a number of core classes as well. Uh, so the first Player's Handbook did only contain eight classes in the, the Player's Handbook. Uh, the first one, which seems a bit lackluster, but when you actually add all the playable uh, character classes together from all three books, uh, eventually by 2010 there was actually a total of 22 uh, fully playable classes that go from levels 1 through 30. Uh, now another uh, major change in 4th uh, edition was the introduction of magic items in the player's handbook itself, instead of being in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Um, now, I guess part of the reasoning behind this is, you know, magic items are a big part of the game. Players are going to have quite a few of them, and with 3rd edition there were, seemed to be a lot of instances, at least uh, locally with me, where players were bringing uh, Dungeon Master's guides to the table so they could look through uh, the magic item descriptions. So, having that in mind, uh, Wizards of the Coast did decide to include them in the player's handbook. That way that was the only book you needed to bring to the table. Uh, now another thing that is worth noting is that magic items were simplified quite a bit from what they were in 3rd edition. So they only had usually a single purpose as opposed to having this uh, slew of abilities. So uh, AS wasn't a horrible thing to have them for convenience sake to let the DM when they give it a magic item just say this is what it is and you can find it on this page. And part of the reason why it makes sense for that is identifying magic items in 4th edition did become a lot easier. Uh, all you had to do was basically spend time studying it over the course of a short rest. And once you did that, you kind of understood what the magic item was. Uh, so seeing as how it kind of replaced things like an identify spell, uh, it made sense, again, to just sort of have them all in, uh, in the player's handbook. So still not a huge fan of that decision, uh, but I'll accept it for, you know, the reason why they had decided to do it. So that was basically the player's handbook. Um, now let's have a look at the Dungeon Master's Guide. The 4th edition Dungeon Master's Guide focused heavily on material to help DMs run the game uh, and contains some great information about different types of RPGs, or RPG players I should say. Um, and what's great about that is that it's designed to really help out, uh, especially newer uh, people to the game, uh, helps them identify what kind of players you may have at your table as well as ways to interact with them. Uh, so it breaks them down sort of into uh, archetypes, so you've got like the storyteller, uh, you've got the actor, or you even have the dreaded power gamer. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the Dungeon Master's Guide uh, goes into basically information about how they typically act at the table, uh, the kind of things that motivate them as players, as well as some great suggestions on how to help engage them, as well as things to kind of uh, try to avoid or steer them away from. Um, now in addition to that, there's a lot of other great information about uh, things like how to build parties, uh, tips for the different types of uh, DMs that you could have, uh, or that you could try to be like uh, introdu introducing table rules, uh, things like preparation time, how to uh, kind of go over and describe things, how to pass time, uh, you know, narration, role playing. There's just a lot of really great information just in the first couple of chapters alone. And now I know that it was written more or less for uh, newer players, but I think there's a lot of great information in here. Uh, in this Dungeon Master's Guide that even veteran players uh, would really be able to benefit from. Uh, just those first two chapters about identifying player types, um, how, to, how to help them out, how to bring them more actively into the game, you know, how to sort of engage them. 
uh, as players, how to uh, prep your uh, sessions and how to do so if you don't have a lot of time, like if you only have an hour or four hours or if you don't have any time. There's just some really great information in there. Uh, and again, it's probably one of my favorite sections of any of the Dungeon Master's guides that uh, had come out to this point. Uh, now the rest of the book uh, contains mostly information about uh, designing encounters, uh, be it uh, combat encounters or non-combat encounters if you know you want to run like a skill-based, uh, you know, more role-playing encounter. Uh, it goes over all that information in there as well, has a lot of information on uh, skill contests or skill checks and uh, how to use those. Uh, so a lot of great information in here, uh, definitely to design or designed to help help the Dungeon Masters out. Goes into some great world building information, goes into some great information about how to use, uh, how to design campaigns or how to use um, pre-written information, like if you wanted to uh, run a fully designed published campaign, it gives you tips on how to do that. Uh, it also gives you a little bit of information on, you know, if you want to create your own stuff, uh, just kind of looting uh, published material for ideas. So. Uh, again, really cool uh, write-up and, and one of my, like I said, all-time favorite uh, DMGs ever to put out. Now, one of the things that I really enjoy about the Dungeon Master's Guide in 4th edition is the way that it handles artifacts. Uh, in previous editions, or sorry, uh, in 4th edition, each artifact begins as a powerful magic item um, that has the ability to become more powerful. Uh, all artifacts are sentient items with their own goals and purposes. Um, so one of the things that they have um, is sort of a numerical value that lets you determine uh, the connection between the wielder and the, the artifact. So that would be something that's called concordance. Uh, what that is, it's like I said, it's a numerical score. And if you do things that are in line with what the artifact's uh, motivations and desires are, then you increase that concordance. Uh, when you increase it, it unlocks different abilities that uh, were previously hidden just when you had the standard item uh, when you first got it. Um, getting uh, the concordance score runs basically between 0 and 20 and 16 to 20 is kind of the, the highest that you can really get it um, and that's when it's at its most powerful. Um, however, if you do things that are against the motivations of the artifact, uh, the concordance drops below its starting number and it can actually impose penalties on the players. Uh, or just completely outright abandon the the, uh, the player character. It just it gets up and basically leaves. Um, so this is actually, like I said, in my opinion, one of the uh, the better ways to handle artifacts. Uh, even if you have a high concordance with an artifact, it's eventually going to move on. Either it's done as much as it can do for the player character, and it feels that it's needed elsewhere, or you completed a major task where you know you appeased it to the point where it decides to you know go dormant or rest. Uh, when this happens, the item disappears, and if your concordance is high enough, it can actually leave behind a magic item or something similar of that nature uh, to replace the artifact that departed. Uh, so that's one of the things that I think is actually really cool about the uh, the way artifacts are handled in 4th edition because they design them in a way that they're actually meant to be used. Like in previous editions in 3.5 or even 3rd edition, uh, artifacts were uh, overly powerful to the point where they seriously threatened the campaign balance. Um, and there was no kind of built-in uh, timer with them like what they have in 4th edition. So with 4th edition, artifacts are designed for each tier of play, not just high levels, so you can get them in the Heroic tier, Paragon, or the Epic tier. Uh, and they ha have that ability to, if the DM feels that maybe they are unbalancing the campaign, then you can simply have them move on. And whether they do it beneficially or do it out of spite for the player character is entirely up to the DM. So they have that sort of ultimate control, but it gets you to actually want to incorporate them into your campaign. Now, another great chapter in this book is chapter 10, which is the DM's toolbox. And what it has is just some information about, uh, you know, modifying monsters, uh, creating sort of uh, NPCs, uh, you know, villains, stuff like that, whether they be new solo monsters or things like that. It gives you uh, some mannerisms, quirks, and different things that you can kind of keep in mind when designing them. Uh, it's got information on uh, how to design house rules and what things to kind of look at and what things to kind of avoid, as well as a couple of examples that they have in there as well. But one of my favorite things that they have is just the ability to create sort of random dungeons. Uh, so if you end up running a game on the fly or the player characters go off in a completely unexpected uh, avenue and 
uh, decide they want to just go dungeon crawling and you didn't have anything prepared, uh, you actually have a series of charts that you can just roll on while things are kind of happening throughout the game to create a dungeon from scratch. Which in my opinion is just absolutely fantastic. You know, it's got things like uh, exits, <coughs> features, you know, hallway length, room size, uh, encounters. Uh, just a lot of really cool uh, things that you can have. Uh, it takes a little bit of prep time for things like uh, encounters because you may uh, want to have some just ready-made NPCs or uh, monsters set aside. But it's, in my opinion, it's just a really great, uh, useful uh, chapter in the book that I think more uh, Dungeon Master's Guides really could have used. It's just the ability to help uh, people on the fly like that. Now, similar to the Player's Handbook, uh, the Dungeon Master's Guide did actually get a, a subsequent uh, release as the Dungeon Master's Guide 2. Uh, now, the DMG 2 is focused primarily on uh, the Paragon tier of adventuring. So, the first DMG was pretty generic and wanted to cover everything, uh, all three tiers of play. Uh, the DMG 2 was more focused on uh, the Paragon tier, which is really cool. Um, sort of like the higher level play, uh, levels 11 through 20. Uh, unfortunately, they never did get around to releasing a, uh, a Dungeon Master's Guide 3, which if they would have, probably would have contained stuff for Epic Adventures, so uh, 21 to 30. Um, not much really to say about the Dungeon Master's Guide 2 at this point, other than the fact that, you know, like I said, it is built around uh, designing things for uh, the Paragon tier. So that's kind of my look at the Dungeon Master's Guide. Now let's have a look at the Monster Manual. The Monster Manual is probably the most simple and straightforward of the, the three initial core books. Uh, it's exactly what pretty much every other version of the Monster Manuals have been, which is a large collection of just different monsters for the player characters to fight. Uh, it's got things like, you know, the Tarrasque, Angels, Demons, Devils, Dragons, uh, Beholders, uh, pretty much all the, uh, the staples that you would find in, uh, in most D&D games. Um, now, one thing that is sort of unique about the 4th edition Monster Manual, however, is in addition to having sort of the generic uh, encounters, you know, monsters that you would fight, even powerful ones like Ancient Dragons and, uh, you know, the Balors or, or uh, Pit Fiends, things like that, um, the Monster Manual in 4th edition also included well, what's called an epic threat. Uh, so, unlike just having your generic monsters, the 4th uh, edition Dungeon Master's Guide also included this large, powerful enemy that you could actually build an entire campaign around, meant to be something to challenge 30th level characters uh, in sort of a climactic battle to end a campaign. Uh, the epic threats uh, that are included in the Monster Manual were spoiled on the cover, so like for example in the Monster Manual here, the epic threat that they include was Orcus, uh, which you see has the same art as on the on the cover. Uh, so it goes into some actual information, some lore, uh, their tactics, as well as some of their uh, minions that you may encounter throughout the course of a campaign. So it doesn't just have the uh, the creature itself, it actually has some information about some encounter groups that you could use to kind of build up the threat as you go through. Uh, using Orcus as an example here, it's actually got encounters for that are ninth, like, considered ninth level, twenty uh, second, twenty fourth, twenty eighth, and Orcus himself, which is uh, a thirty three uh, challenge rating just by himself. Uh, so I thought this was actually a really great addition because again, it gives you something that, as a first time DM, you actually have sort of a major villain that you could revolve an entire campaign around. Uh, just to start off with in one of the core books. So I think that was actually a really cool idea. Um, they did something similar with uh, the Monster Manual as they did with the Player's Handbook and the Dungeon Master's Guide, of course. So there were uh, subsequent releases of the Monster Manual. So we have the Monster Manual 2, uh, <coughs> which featured Demogorgon as its main threat. And then the Monster Manual 3. Uh, now the Monster Manual 2 came out in May of 2009. And in uh, June of 2010, the Monster Manual 3 released, uh, which had a lot of stuff involving Drow, and of course, its epic threat was Lolf. 
So, with all of these books, each of these books, as you can actually see here, even the Monster Manual 3, uh, all the Player's Handbooks, all the Dungeon Master's Guide, and all the Monster Manuals were actually considered to be part of the core rules. So instead of just having the three core rule books that you had in 3rd uh, edition, and a bunch of supplements from there, uh, Wizards of the Coast actually designed 4th edition with multiple uh, core rule books uh, designed to be released over the course of the following years. Uh, so this actually brought the total number of core rule books up from the traditional three to a total of eight different books. Now, in addition to the, uh, the, the core rule books, they also released a slew of supplements. So we are going to look at just a few of those as well. So when it comes to supplements, one of the first set of books that I want to discuss are actually ones that I never picked up personally. Uh, but there were a series of books that were actually dedicated to each of the power sources that the players, the various players' handbooks introduced. Uh, so these were books that were titled things like Primal Power, uh, Martial Power, Arcane Power, Divine Power. I think Sonic Power was another one as well. Uh, most of those books contained variant class features um, as well as some Paragon Paths. Uh, feats and other, uh, probably the thing, magic items, stuff like that, that were designed for characters of those archetypes. Like martial ones would have things that were designed for fighters, paladins, uh, rangers, rogues, and so on. Uh, now each of these books, or at least most of them, also ended up receiving a follow-up. So uh, in addition to the regular power books, like Martial Power, there was also like a Martial Power 2. Uh, now I personally, like I said, never bought those books just because um, I didn't really want <clears throat> to be flooded with options in terms of having too many books that I'd have to start referencing if the player characters in my campaigns uh, started using things from those books. So, And overall... Uh, they just kind of led to combinations of skills and powers and uh, features and things like that that uh, weren't probably the most well-conceived in terms of how they interacted with each other. And I just didn't want to add any sort of extra unstabilizing <coughs> elements to my campaigns. Uh, but there were also a slew of other um, supplements that they had released. I just got a few of them here, just kind of an example of how they didn't only break down the core rule books um, into multiple volumes, or even the class-based supplements into multiple volumes, but they did it with a lot of other books as well. Uh, <clears throat> now, there were a few that were kind of standalone, like the Demonomicon and Open Graves, which was designed for like undead and stuff like that. Uh, but when you get into other things, like they had the Manual of the Planes, uh, which goes over the cosmology for 4th edition. Um, but after that, they also ended up releasing two other books um, dedicated to different uh, planar regions. So they had uh, the Plane Above, which was the uh, Secrets of the Astral Sea, and then the Plane Below, uh, Secrets of the Elemental Chaos. So if you wanted uh, planar source books, there were actually three different ones that, that you have to choose from. As well, uh, they took the Draconomicon, which is one of my favorite um, books from 3.5, <clears throat> and they actually ended up breaking it down into two volumes as well, one on uh, Chromatic Dragons and one on Metallic Dragons. Uh, now again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about uh, the information in these books themselves. Uh, I may decide to dedicate that to, uh, to future series if anybody's interested. But I just kind of wanted to show that the decision to break down the books into multiple volumes wasn't just reserved for the, uh, the players' books. They did it with other things like Draconomicons and the uh, Manual of the Plains. Um, <clears throat> now, all that aside, you know, it sounds kind of negative, but... Um, you know, we'll kind of move on from that and, you know, discuss just how uh, the initial run of 4th edition went. So, while pre-orders for 4th edition um, were strong, uh, and it did sell well to begin with, unfortunately sales began to drop off as time went on. Uh, one of the factors is what I just kind of brought up, which is just the sheer volume of uh, books that were being released. Uh, it was just way too many to start keeping up with. Um, Wizards of the Coast also failed to win over diehard fans from earlier editions, including D&D 3.5, which still had a strong and dedicated fan base. Uh, another reason uh, for the drop in sales uh, has to do with the fact that uh, Wizards of the Coast, through a series of their uh, decisions, which some may say are very poor decisions, actually set the stage and paved the way to their biggest competitor. So we'll discuss that competitor now.
In late 2002, a company by the name of Pezo Publishing obtained the publication rights to Dragon Magazine, uh, Dungeon Magazine, and the RPGA or Role Playing Gamers Association uh, magazine Polyhedron. Uh, they were able to do so as Ridge of the Coast were outsourcing elements of Dungeons and Dragons to alleviate their financial burden. Uh, publications such as the regular magazines uh, and even established campaign settings uh, like Dragonlance, which were uh, granted to Mongoose Publishing, and Ravenloft, which was granted to Sword and Sorcery, which was a division of White Wolf. Uh, so these were all done to kind of uh, alleviate the stress, I guess, on, uh, on Wizards of the Coast and allow them to release things more or less for the, the core game as well as the, the few major campaign settings that they wanted to support uh, themselves. Uh, so doing this, uh, Pezo uh, initially combined, when they got the rights for the magazines, they initially combined Polyhedron uh, with Dungeon Magazine, as neither publication was doing particularly well at the time that Pezo acquired the rights. Uh, Pezo did do quite a bit of work uh, to try to fix the uh, the magazines, especially Dragon or Dungeon Magazine, I should say. And uh, they, their work on Dungeon Magazine specifically was highly praised, uh, especially after the introduction of the very first campaign path known as Shackled City, <clears throat> which was a campaign designed to take players from 1st to 20th level. Uh, Dungeon Magazine, after the success of Shackled City, uh, was now strong enough to stand on its own. However, the same unfortunately could not be said uh, for Polyhedron, which was discontinued when in September 2004, uh, Pezo rebranded both Dragon and Dungeon Magazines, uh, with Dragon Magazine focusing on player-related material and Dungeon Magazine f focusing on material specifically for Dungeon Masters, as well as including uh, three separate adventures in each issue, uh, one of low level, one of medium level, and one of high level. Uh, Pezo was actually successful enough with uh, Dungeon Magazine that in August of 2007, uh, they released a revised full version of Shackled City in full color and hardcover form. So the future looked bright for Pezo uh, up until uh, April of 2007 when Wizards of the Coast announced that they were going to cease publication of both Dragon Magazine and Dungeon Magazines and would instead focus on releasing them as an online digital form. Uh, this came as a pretty heavy blow to Pezo, but it also presented them with an opportunity. Uh, Pezo announced that they were going to continue releasing campaign paths uh, under the 3.5 Open Gaming License. Uh, and with that, they released Rise of the Rune Lords, uh, Burnt Offerings. That was the first of a six-part campaign path. And they released that in August of 2007 uh, with the final issue of Dungeon and Dragon magazines coming out the following month. Uh, Pezo offered to carry over for, uh, subscriptions actually as well for people that were subscribed to Dragon and Dungeon Magazine if they wanted to carry those over to the Rise of the Rune Lords for people that were interested. Um, while their early standalone products were designed strictly for the OGL, the Open Gaming License, uh, Pezo did end up deciding to make some changes of their own uh, and decided they were going to actually start releasing their own products. Uh, they began an 18 month open play test available to any and all that chose uh, to do so, to participate. Uh, all they had to do was go onto Pezo's official website, uh, download the, uh, the rules, and uh, they were given the option to providing player feedback. Uh, that playtest would culminate with the release of the Pathfinder uh, role-playing game Core Rulebook, which came out in August of 2009, which was a little over a year after the release of 4th edition Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, Pathfinder still utilized the 3.5 OGL, uh, but it did see much of the, or many of the classes improve to give them uh, new abilities, new options, and just uh, more uh, potential to have uh, different versions of the same class. Uh, another thing that they did uh, that was actually a really smart idea is Pezo combined their Player's Handbook along with their Dungeon Master's Guide into one volume. So the core rulebook actually contained both the Player's Handbook and the DMG. So having this release as well uh, went a long way to helping to bring back uh, players' uh, goodwill uh, towards Pezo because, you know, they, they did this in a way, and I almost think that they released the core rule book as the player's handbook and the DMG together as a way of saying that they were going to be different from Wizards of the Coast, who at the time, as I said, uh, adopted a model which focused on them releasing uh, a t 
volumes and volumes for individual books, like three player's handbooks, uh, two Draconomicons. So initially the, the Pathfinder role-playing game was done in such a way that it was very light in the products being released and focused heavily on their campaign paths. Uh, so Pathfinder, what they did with this game, using the 3.5 open gaming license, is they found a way to provide new material to disenfranchised consumers who were not happy with the direction that uh, Dungeons & Dragons was going in, uh, as well as those who were still diehard 3.5 fans. Because, again, if you remember at the uh, beginning of my previous video, um, 3.5 had only been around for five years. So the consumers that had bought into 3.5, they still wanted to play that version of the game. Uh, with Wizards of the Coast releasing 4th edition only five years after 3.5 came out, uh, it kind of upset a lot of people in that regard. So uh, this provided them with an opportunity to continue to play a version of the game that they uh, wanted to stick with. Uh, it was actually similar enough to 3.5 that uh, fans unofficially labeled Pathfinder as being Dungeons & Dragons version 3.75. Uh, now, while it's been difficult to find actual figures, uh, the general consensus is that Pathfinder quickly began to outsell 4th edition, uh, and continued to do so for the rest of 4th edition's run. Uh, it's also difficult to say for certain, but it's highly possible that had Wizards of the Coast continued uh, the regular publication, uh, printed publication of their monthly periodicals, rather than pursuing the online model, uh, that the need for the Pathfinder game <clears throat> may have never actually come up. And Pezo may have continued to support uh, the new version of Dungeons and Dragons, rather than feeling that they had to go and create their own game. Uh, <clears throat> so again, Wizards of the Coast decision to do that, uh, as well as uh, another issue that led to the creation of uh, Pathfinder, was after Wizards of the Coast announced that they were going to cease uh, Dungeon and Dragon magazine in printed form, uh, they took a long time uh, from that announcement to the time when they finally announced uh, their what was called the game system license for fourth edition, which was similar to the open gaming license for uh, 3.5. However, it was much more restrictive in terms of what you would actually be able to use. Um, so with all those decisions in place, uh, Wizards of the Coast uh, really kind of uh, set the stage for Pathfinder to come out and set the stage for a product to come out that captured the audience that felt that Wizards of the Coast had turned their back on them. In the end, Wizards of the Coast's decisions uh, going from 3.5 into 4th edition were ultimately responsible for the demise of 4th edition. Uh, they were suffering from supplement bloat as well as unfortunately just subpar playtesting. With all that and with the release of Pathfinder, Dungeons and Dragons was no longer the number one selling tabletop RPG. So, in response to this, in an attempt to kind of right the ship and to get some more life out of 4th edition, uh, Wizards of the Coast did decide to strip 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons down to its essentials. So that's where we're going to leave off for part 2. Uh, so in this video we looked at uh, the supplements that were released for 4th edition, the physical hardcovers that were released, as well as setting the stage for what uh, ended up being the Pathfinder role-playing game. Uh, be sure to check out part 3, where I discuss the answer to Pathfinder, which was Dungeons & Dragons Essentials. See you then.